This episode, I'm joined by Eric O. Springstead, who is the co-founder of the American Vey Society and has served as its president for 33 years. He's the author and editor of many previous books, including Simone Vey, Late Philosophical Writings. In this episode, we discuss his newest book, Simone Vey, for the 21st century. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Hermetics for as little as $2.50 a month and keep the show going indefinitely because it is very much appreciated, then please find links in the description below alongside links for joining our community. Enjoy. So, Eric O. Springstead, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Delight to be here to uh, talk with you. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be discussing your book, which was only published just a month ago in the UK. I'm not sure if there was different publishing dates around the world, but um, Simone Vey for the 21st Century, uh, published by University of Notre Dame Press. Uh, we'll be discussing that book alongside, you know, the work of Simone Vey generally. But before we jump in, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is, what it is you do, and how this book came about. Well, I don't do much of anything right now. I'm retired, <laughs> which is how this book came, came about. Um, actually, the, the book has been the result of really 25 years of, of essays and work on, on VE. Um, I've been working on VE probably since 1975. Uh, I did my PhD dissertation on it. And shortly after I finished, uh, my mentor, Diogenes Allen at Princeton Seminary, and I founded the American Bay Society. Uh, and actually, the society just had its 40th annual meeting last week. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, it's been a great place to, to do work. Uh, and a lot of what is in here is a result of work, you know, that I've done over the course of time uh, with the Vey Society and, and often with uh, the French Association as well. Uh, and this was a chance to put all of this together. And I'm actually rather pleased that it turned out I've been rather coherent over, over the years. <laughs> wow. So a book which is really like 45 years worth of study condensed into one book that's uh, an impressive feat i'm afraid so <laughs> i'm not I'm sure if it's impressive but it's a feat <laughs> okay and i'm right in thinking you're um a reverend i'm a presbyterian minister presbyterian and minister. I, my my career has basically been one where i have it's been both scholarly and pastoral uh, consistently. Uh, and I think that over the course of the last 40 years, uh, I've only had a year or two where I wasn't explicitly doing some kind of pastoral work, but I don't think there's been any year either in which I haven't been explicitly doing academic work or had some sort of uh, academic connection. So, you know, I, at the beginning, I wasn't sure which way I was supposed to go, and I didn't didn't go either way. I went, I went both <laughs> for a rather long time. So, okay, that seems like a a very veiled way to approach to approach life. Yeah, I, but it wasn't necessarily a choice. <laughs> okay, it just fell into place that way. Okay. Somehow these things just sort of unfold this way. So. Yeah, yeah. Which, which means that they probably are the way that it should have gone from the beginning. Definitely. Had I chosen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So before we jump specifically into the philosophy and perhaps we can, you know, I would say the mysticism, but we can talk about that word later of Simone Weil, I have to ask you the Hermetics question. Uh, you can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? And as we're talking about Simone Weil, we can include her, she's already there, and add three more. Well, I, I'm actually glad that you, you asked the question that way because so many people ask it, well, could you have a dinner party? Could you have these three people? And, and I'm not sure that they'd be good dinner companions. No. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but I think 
you know, the, the three that I would put in the room besides they herself would be Plato, Augustine, and Wittgenstein. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, I've been trying to imagine that conversation or uh, having made, up, made it up myself. And if I could just put all of them together and listen to them without trying to, to imagine what I think they would say, that would be a wonderful uh, event to be at. Yeah, that's an interesting room. I mean, I'm usually coming at, com uh, at philosophy from the continental tradition. That's what I'm trained in. So Wittgenstein, my Wittgenstein is, is very weak. I've only really read the major works compilation book, um, and I haven't ventured into the latest stuff. So, you know, forgive me if I'm wrong here, but could we say Wittgenstein is the only person in that room who considers himself secular, you know, an atheist? Or does he have... I, I, does he change I mean, it? Wittgen... I think Wittgenstein would would consider himself not a believer, but I think that's partly because he had such a high understanding of what belief actually should involve. Uh, I, I think that one of the things that they and Wittgenstein very much had in common is that they believed that value really came in several different levels. Uh, and within the contemporary world, there are two of the few people who didn't try to flatten the world uh, and who weren't reductionistic and who not only fought against reductionism, but I think in their own thinking had a very fine sense uh, of how there were different levels and how one needed to respect them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Do you think maybe that would be the the tangent that 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 room would gravitate towards is, you know, what it is to to believe to have some sort of faith for something higher? I think so. I mean, and, and I think what it, what does it mean to talk about that? Um, you know, I mean, Vey and Wittgenstein didn't didn't meet. They wrote about the same time, uh, and yet I think you know that there's a great deal of overlap in there reaction to the way that philosophy was done. Uh, Wittgenstein certainly thought very highly of, of Augustine. Uh, they probably less so insofar as she didn't read a lot of him explicitly, uh, but I think her questions were and the way that she approached things was so very much like, uh, like Augustine. And of course, Augustine and they uh, and Wittgenstein, to a certain degree, uh, owed an awful lot to Plato. Mm. Uh, so, so maybe this would just be a lecture by Plato, and uh, the other three of them could ask questions afterwards. <laughs> I often think that about these rooms. That sometimes people put in figures who are so gigantic. Do you think? I think everyone else would be stopped in their tracks. If you, if you know, the, the if, problem if you I can't figure out is. Yeah, I can't figure out how there'd actually be a conversation because they are all such big figures. I think they'd all want to have the four most of the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe not Wittgenstein. He he was uh, he was quite reserved. I think. Or, or... Until he till, till he grabbed hold of a point and then he would <laughs> insist. On. <laughs> as long as and he, he didn't he didn't suffer fools gladly. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Maybe he'd be reserved until someone made an an error and then he'd pick up the poker. And go after <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Well, I imagine these 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 thinkers probably will come back in, especially Plato. Um, but firstly, I think you know we it's Simone Weil is quite a, strange in the sense of situating her philosophically in the history of philosophy because she has an extremely short life uh, compared to some philosophers. You know, they they they're easier to situate because they've they've had that almost you could say oh this was their. So, you know, X era, and then they had this era, and then this era, and they were working with certain people, and of course, Faith's working with certain people, but at the same time, a lot of people focus on her biography, even though it's very short, so how can we situate, firstly, how can we situate Vey, you know, in the history of philosophy, but also, why is it, why is it been that her biography almost always overtakes her actual theory? Well, I mean, I think, because her life was was simply extraordinary. Uh, 
And it was during a time in which there were an awful lot of extraordinary people uh, who were doing some very extraordinary things. Uh, but, but there's sort of a dedication and a sincerity. Uh, she doesn't only make very strong comments. Uh, she goes out and does them, which absolutely astounds people. Uh, and as a result of that, some people have seen that as giving authenticity to what she said. Uh, some people say, well, it just proves that what she's saying is absolutely crazy. Uh, but I mean, I think she what, what she said, even though sometimes it was, was way over the top uh, and really hyperbolic at times, uh, I mean, I think she believed that it could be lived. And, and, and to go back to Wittgenstein, I mean, I think there was a man who was, who was strictly an intellectual, but who believed it needed to be lived. He, he took time and uh, during the war served as an orderly in a, in a hospital, uh, quit academic work for a long time and tried to be a teacher. Uh, he didn't work well with young children as it turned out. <laughs> Uh, but, but I mean, th th there was this sort of dedication to life. And I think that one probably should never, with Vey's thinking, ever think that she didn't believe that it should be lived in some way. And that, that one's thinking really needed to come out of living. Now, with that said, uh, what happens with, with any philosopher is that after a while on the street, they, they become a bunch of set options. Uh, you know, what is a Wittgensteinian position? What is a Platonic position? Um, what is a Valian position? Uh, and, and I think I've, I'm noticing that more and more um, in academic work on, on Ve. I mean, there are certain things that we keep returning to all of the time. Uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into this further on in this discussion. Uh, the notion of attention is, is one. You know, that out of all of these years of discussion really has percolated to the top of as being you know, what, what she's about. But I also think that it, it really shouldn't be divorced in the way that she herself practiced it. And I think that, that helps us focus uh, on what exactly she meant by it, because uh, I, I think there tends to be a lot of slippage once it comes into common parlance. Yeah, that seems to happen with quite a few philosophers that the uh, the more practical aspects of their theory or their philosophy often gets pushed away in in favor of sort of a strictly academic, you know, we're just going to discuss it as opposed to practice it. And the, do you think that's an impossibility with Ve? Is you can't separate these two? I, I don't think you should do it. Uh, and I think part of the problem is that the slippage is that we start rounding the edges off. Uh, I mean, and again, we'll get into this later on the notion of attention that it now means what we normally mean by attention and not what necessarily what she meant, which had some pretty sharp edges to it. Okay, okay. I mean, perhaps... As you say, attention is this this the thing which, as you say, sort of is always there for Vey and is of strict importance. Perhaps we could bring this in now. What what is the difference for what is the what does Vey mean by attention as opposed to how we mean it now? And perhaps that that'll help us articulate why it is we need to uh, keep things within their context. Sure, good good idea. I mean, I think for her, attention it's developed particularly in one little essay that she wrote for uh, a girl's school. And it's called The Right Reflections on the Use of School Studies with a View Towards the Love of God. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and she's arguing, <laughs> quite a title, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, but she's arguing that the point of school studies is actually the attention you pay to it. It isn't the grades, it isn't your ability to manipulate uh, information. And she defines attention as putting aside whatever is in your own interest, what is going on in your mind, and just plain focusing 
on what's in front of you. And she says, it doesn't really matter if you succeed at getting the problem or not. The ability to actually pay attention to something that's outside of you is what's most important. Now, I think what that's a terrifically important idea. Um, but I think often what happens now with the way it gets discussed is that Everybody says, yes, that's important. We live in a terribly distracted society. We don't focus on things. We don't pay attention to things. But what they then take her to mean is simply, we should notice things. Hmm. And we, I mean, we sh certainly should. Um, we should notice more people than we do. Uh, and she use examples of how we can put people aside and not even notice that they're there. And, and I think, you know, she certainly thinks that should happen. But she believes really at the basis of attention is, an, is it's actually a matter of suspending the self uh, for a moment and letting whatever you're paying attention to suddenly reveal itself and occupy your space. Uh, and she thought that was virtually an impossibility because to live, we need to exercise power, we need to use force. Uh, and that isn't always brutal. I mean, there's social force. Um, we have prestige, we have social standing and so on. And if we give that up, it's virtually giving up our life, uh, at least socially. Now, I said that that's sort of an impossibility. She thinks it's a matter of grace. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that in fact, it isn't something that we just do, uh, which noticing allows us to be still in charge. I mean, so for her, it's a matter, do we open up and let something reveal itself? Or do we sort of stay in charge, including in charge of our own moral life as to who will notice? I mean, I've frequently heard people say, oh, I, I'm not sure if I would pay attention to that person or not. Well, you actually, in paying attention, you don't choose that way. Uh, she thinks it's a matter of, 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 again, opening yourself. And when she says that one uses these school studies with a view towards the love of God, it's sort of like having a room with a view. You, you can see it from here. <laughs> You know, and if you're not seeing the love of God out of what you're talking about with attention, you're not you're not seeing what she's talking about uh, as attention being. Okay, okay. So that contemporary definition of attention is one in which you pay attention almost for some sort of way to askew the data to your own habits or your own sort of material world. Whereas this form of attention is one where you just objectively, whatever's happening. You don't alter it in any way. You allow the, you know, the pre-given world of God to just be, and then what? And then you know, just open yourself to that. Right, and I mean, she thinks it's momentary. That's not easy to do, <laughs> you know. And, and, and it may happen uh, when we look at something beautiful. For once, it cracks our armor uh, and lets itself in. But we we then go back to the normal way we, we do things. And you can be a really nice guy. I mean, you can be, be polite. Uh, you can uh, you can notice people all of the time, and and that's a wonderful thing if you do. Uh, but she thinks attention is letting something from the outside in and giving it life within within your own life, and that changes you. Uh, and you're not being changed by what you've decided by your discipline by your self-improvement uh you just let in some reality that you have absolutely no control over and you don't know what it's going to do to you right all right so do you do you think that that's i mean i sort of see the connection there and perhaps you you'd be able to open it out a bit more than i i can articulate but um do you see a connection there with the, the you know the christian precept of know thyself do you think that's what that process is about is that in accepting that and not allowing it to just become another, you know, thing that happens, but actually in attempting to open yourself to the Lord, 
you owe to God and accepting grace, you you know thyself. You, you or you at least. I, I think in the I think in the end you do. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the Christian precept. It's actually a Socratic precept to say know thyself, but it's not. It's not foreign to Christianity. Uh, Paul, in the letter to the Colossians, said, "Ourselves are hid with Christ in God." Uh, and so, I mean, in that sense, you pay attention to what's outside of you. Uh, ultimately, you will find uh, a very different self uh, in God than, than you thought you had. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think one can make that connection if you go through those steps. Mm -hmm. However, she doesn't think in, in that case that you pay attention th to things in order to know yourself. That's again focusing back on yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so you know the paradox, but it, but I think it's in Plato, not just in Christianity. Uh, the paradox is that you know yourself by actually knowing the world that you live in. That's yeah, that's a tough and paradox, not, and not by focusing on yourself. Yeah, sort of the the difficult moral paradox of: Am I doing this because I'm a good person, or because I? want to be, you know i want to act as a good person and the difference seems to be key you know one is just a sincere openness the other is a almost like a self-justifying yeah and i think that's why attention actually is such an important idea because you can you can get up caught up in that discussion and you know keep saying am i doing it for myself or i'm not doing it you know and then you absolutely paralyze yourself uh, if you could simply say, no, pay attention to some, something else other than yourself. I mean, pay attention, focus on it, let it speak to you. Uh, and again, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, and as long as you stay, it's very difficult. But you realize it's not a choice. It's a matter of letting the other thing reveal itself to you. Mm -hmm. So, just, uh, it, Sorry. And again, I, th I think she believes that it's really actually sort of episodic in the beginning. And, and I think that any number of us can, can say, we've had such an experience, an experience of beauty, of a person who suddenly we saw that we'd never really seen in a very clear light before. And, and then we go back to our normal life. But she thinks that if you keep at it, that not only do these things increase, but that ultimately uh, it becomes a matter of always waiting to be revealed to you. And that's the real change. I mean, the, it, I don't think she used this as, as a deliberate pun, but you can do it in French. You know, from attention, attention comes attent, waiting, where, where it becomes a permanent state of being. So in that sort of pun that you're recognizing there, in that perma the irony of, or paradox even, of a permanent waiting, it, it, does that bring about just a sort of acceptance of what is now? You know, if you're permanently waiting for something, there's no, yeah. you, 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 ex you know, you just accept the present as it is. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. Okay, okay. Does Vey see herself as continuing any... You know, with these this attentive practice or, or almost non-practice, because it's not something you're, you know, forcing yourself yeah. to do in a way. Does she see her, see herself as continuing any specific, you know, Christian tradition? Is she of any specific denomination, or is it uh, almost more of a, you know, a continual um, current for her? I think she discovered this uh, on on her own, or you know, I mean, it sort of hit her. Uh, she said she'd never, before her own mystical experience, she'd never read the mystics. And I think she's rather proud of that because she then believes it wasn't a matter of auto-suggestion. I mean, you know, self-deception was something that she worried about constantly, and she thought everybody had a problem with it. However, afterwards, uh, she did start reading uh, the mystics. And... She, she recognized her own experience and what she was thinking and what they were saying. And in particular, uh, she was very much drawn to St. John of the Cross, the 16th century 
Spanish mystic. Um, and she saw in him actually complete description of the method, if you want to put it that way, of, of the spiritual life, uh, sort of, <clears throat> of how one sheds one's empirical ego or, or self uh, and sort of ends up in a void. Uh, that's the dark night of the soul. Uh, and out of that come, comes the light. And I think she believed that, you know, something like that was the, was the accurate description of the spiritual life. So, so she very much does owe something uh, to the Christian mystics such as um, St. As John. Uh, but she also sees it, uh, hints of it in, in other religions. Uh, she she he's, sees it in Buddhism. Uh, she sees it in uh, the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, she didn't seem to study much much Islam, but uh, but of those two other religions, she certainly did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. I mean, I, I'm not sure how it was interesting. The words you used there, the description of religious experience, which actually, you know, it's always interesting to see the thinkers that you brought in at the start come back in, and of course. Wittgenstein, you could almost say his entire philosophical enterprise was, at least in the background, is this problem of in- intelligibility and how can we communicate, well, communicate anything effectively between one another. And that is one of the key problems of philosophy. But I guess when you bring that into that Valian position, one of the key problems there is the intelligibility of of God, of the religious experience. And how can we approach that? And did Vey ever really directly comment on how it is she can even write of these things? You know, is something lost for Vey in the process of the experience itself and writing of the experience? Um, I, I think that much of the experience actually is it's clarified and go to go to her own. Uh, experience uh, when she in the in the thirties uh, went with her mother to Salem, France, to listen to the Gregorian chant, which was particularly of a distinctive kind. There, she went during Holy Week, and uh, she said she was suffering from these migraines that she'd had had all her life. Uh, while she was there, somebody. Uh, a young Englishman, uh, it may have been an American, uh, taught her George Herbert's poem, Love. And she memorized it. And she kept reciting it during these uh, terrific migraines. And she was listening to this music, which was not helping the migraine, <laughs> even though you know, and, and it was typical of her not to give up, even though, because it was something beautiful. <laughs> And she said that was when she had this experience of a personal visitation of Christ. And she noted at that point that it did not get rid of the pain. And yet she had this experience of perfect love. And she said that was what allowed her to understand or to envision how perfect love is possible even in the midst of suffering. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know that means intellectually she got a hold of it, but what she did realize is the way that she was going about the problem of goodness versus suffering was not right. Uh, I mean, there was a sudden insight here that love was possible in suffering, unconquerable love was possible in suffering. Uh, and I think that's, that's the mystical experience. And then, you know, what she does after that, and it's a revolution in thinking, is a matter of working that out. Uh, what, do, what does that mean? Uh, how, how do we deal with that? And that's sort of the way, well, Plato talked about, you know, we were dragged out of the cave, we saw the sun, and then you went back in. Um, and many people have said, you know, her last work, The Need for Roots, uh, 
is the work of somebody who's come back into the cave uh, and describing you know, how to arrange things you know, once you've seen the light. Because you see that the problems of the cave are not the real problem. Yeah. I mean, the, the, always the problem of the end of the, the famous cave uh, allegory or myth is that people forget that the person who comes back into the cave, the people who are still in the cave, are generally quite hostile to that person, right? Yeah. They want to they wanna stay yeah, with the yeah, shadows. Yeah, he's, he's shadows. wrong. Yeah, he's wrong. Get out. I think I think perhaps it's been a long time since I read the sort of original. Obviously, loads of people use it as a, as a sort of metaphor or allegory. But I think goes so far as to say that they're actually quite violent towards them they want to they want to kill them right because they're so comfortable with the shadows they're so comfortable with that reality no one wants their reality completely torn up especially when someone comes back in in the case of ve trying to articulate why suffering which you've always been intuitively taught to believe is the worst thing ever is actually a a lesson you know and a very important lesson does she, does she then go on to sort of utilize suffering in her philosophy a lot she does. Um, I mean, she doesn't say that suffering, she'll talk about affliction, and, and affliction is actually something distinct. I mean, it is soul destroying. Uh, I mean, you know, we'll all put up with suffering. I mean, if you, you want to learn to play the piano, you'll learn to do scales, and you have to practice. Um, affliction, you can't, you can't really consent to. But she does think that love is still conquers. It still can win in the midst of affliction. And so she uses that lesson to point out that if perfect love is possible in, in that case, and Christ crosses the example, then she thinks the way, the way to reality, uh, the way to redemption is to follow a way of unburdening ourselves of of our social selves, uh, which have been a matter of establishing our own power, uh, our prestige, uh, and that's how we make our way in the world. She says, no, you want real life. You actually need to give up. Mm -hmm. you, you don't delight in suffering. Uh, because in fact, I think there is something positive at the end of it, although she doesn't want you to imagine what that is. That, that's false. Uh, but she just thinks you keep paying attention, you continue to love. Uh, and she thinks in the end, despite whatever suffering that might bring, uh, and it doesn't necessarily, uh, other than personal ego stuff, uh, that she thinks that in fact, you will see reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful phrase in, in her essay, uh, love of God and affliction. Uh, one must uh, needs to want to go to de towards death. And then when, when you get there, one discovers an angel that says he has risen. Hmm. You know, she almost never talks about the resurrection. She thinks people use it as a false consolation. But, you know, in that one phrase, she thinks that if you concentrate on, if you look at death in an unvarnished way mm. uh, and let it do what it will, you'll find light. It reminds me um, much of a passage in Thomas Merton's Seven Story Mountain where he, you know, he mentions the longer you hold on to suffering, the longer you will suffer. You know, the longer you have that relationship with suffering that it, the, the longer you suffer, but he he also makes that distinction between there is that material suffering and then there's a suffering where it's sort of change. And once you, in that process of understanding suffering, you have to let go of the ego. You have to let let go of the 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 uh, you know. I can't. <laughs> I feel bad because I'm going to try quote the Bible here, which is you know someone such as yourself. But it's uh, you know let is it lay the treasures in heaven and not of the earth. I think that's yeah. Yes. <laughs> I yeah. Yeah. Lay, lay up for your. Lay, lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, not on earth. Yeah. And that seems to be that that distinction between two different modes of, um, you know, understanding the world or apprehending the world. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's perverse to fall in love with suffering. 
mm-hmm. and, and and certain people do. Uh, you know, that's where you want to need to go to reality. Uh, and if it seems to lead you to death, you keep looking at reality, and then you put it, it suddenly will appear. Okay. Okay. You mentioned, and, and again, I, and I think it, I think it's not un, unlike like Buddhism. Uh, you know, you, your practice, sitting practice, and meditation, is to get rid of the self, not to focus on it. And uh, and while Buddhists are very coy about, you know, <laughs> what the end result is, I mean, I think the idea is that there is some sense of of reality there if you shed unreality. I guess that's one of the problems back to intelligibility and describing um, almost divine experiences in even the act of description of describing, you're almost always going to be falling back into the ego because you're going to be describing it in relation to your material life. So I guess that's the point where you sort of have to say, I can't describe it to you because it's not of a, a world that you would understand. It's not of that material world anymore. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's that's right, but but I think also what what's important, and I and I say this as somebody who's been a pastor for forty years, uh, don't try to outthink yourself. I mean, <laughs> an awful lot of this is, is actually in practice. Um, you know, don't don't try to say, "Am I closer to the intelligibility? You know, did I get an A on this paper or a B?" Uh, in fact, it, it's, it's daily practice. Uh, if in, she says attention is the uh, is the heart of prayer, mm-hmm. so I mean, in that case, prayer would seem to be the way that you advance. Uh, meditation would be the way that you advance. Uh, reading would be the way that you advance. So, you know, the things by that you can do, uh, should be do, aren't, aren't really all that extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of the problem is the ego always wants something extraordinary. And, and there's tons of stories in, in all sorts of different religious traditions about people who really want to get to the top of the mountain first, or they want a special way of doing it. And the sage always tells them, you know, just, you know sort of calm down. <laughs> You know, just just do daily life attentively, uh, and that'll do it. Okay, okay. You brought um, you you mentioned it brought in the, the you know the the symbol of the cross there, and I understand you mentioned it quite a few times in your text that the the, the, cruc- the crucifixion does is important for veil. It opens up our our spiritual horizons. Am I somewhat right in in that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. I mean. <laughs> There is a sense in which, of course, it's it's always symbolic. I mean, it's symbolic within Christianity, which which believes in it explicitly. Uh, but I think that you know what, one of the things I point out in the book is that through this experience and, and the way that she writes this, she doesn't think that this can be a work of imagination or pure intelligence. She thinks the body has to be on the line. And therefore, you know, what, what's important in um, is that the crucifixion actually happened. Mm-hmm. If it's a mere symbol, then it's advising us to take away that God himself didn't take. <laughs> um, you know, so, so, so she doesn't really insist that, that it's actual, that it's physical, that there's an incarnation. Uh, and she wants to see that then uh, repeated in, in our spiritual practice uh, of learning to self-empty the way that Christ did and live a life, a real life that uh, is like that. Uh, and she, she studied a great deal of uh, world, other world religions and folk literature, which she thinks really goes way, way back and she sees those self-emptying images as ways to truth you know throughout throughout the entire world Mm -hmm. that that it's a it's a natural and and supernatural uh way experience of human beings always okay okay 
So, I mean, this is, one thing that really interests me is is she clearly has this. She's clearly highly, highly intelligent and highly intuitively intelligent, but also, you know, on a practical level, very religious and very spiritual. Did she ever sort of struggle to sort of reconcile these two things? Well, I, I don't think she opposed them um, ever explicitly, or, or at the point that she did was before her religious experience. I mean, she says, well, I thought about the problem of God. I found it insoluble, so I left it alone. Hmm. <laughs> you know, she did not want to make a specific, so she just sort of, it was really sort of agnostic at that point. Uh, again, after her experience, she recognizes that it, the problem was put the wrong way, uh, that it wasn't opposed. And so I, th- I think that, you know, she continues to do intellectual work, but certain problems aren't all that interesting anymore. Um, spiritual life doesn't obliterate them, but she just starts thinking uh, in a different way. And as I said in, a while back, you know, part of this is recognizing that within the world there are, there are different levels of value and meaning. Um, and sorting that through can then can be very important uh, instead of just trying to say, how does this fit there? Well, they may be on utterly different levels. Uh, and by trying to make them fit together, you're actually re- reducing them to a single level, generally always the lower one. <laughs> um, where she does change a bit is that she'd actually already given up an awful lot of um, sort of political activism and and social thinking at the point of her her conversion or her experience, simply because it had been frustrating. Uh, The comrades were were hardly cooperative Mm. (laughs) in the best sort of people, but but she clearly goes back to it in, in her very last months uh, when she wrote The Need for Roots and an awful lot of other stuff when she was working with the Free French in London. And in this case, I don't think she's so much trying to put them together uh, on an intellectual level, uh, but she's trying to imagine what it is like to live life well, how we could do that within a society. Um, you know, that's imbued by grace. Yeah, I mean, this was um, this was a really interesting section for me, this idea of her sort of, I guess, sociological or political, the, you know, there was this sort of clear, out, not outline, but there is a clear focus of this idea that society should be targeted towards what's best for the needs of the soul. Um, and this is in uh, the, the Free French, as you, as you mentioned. And... Um, Perhaps it's it's just because I've been reading a lot of this stuff lately. It's sort of it's interesting to me. I mean, I've been reading a lot of um, Joseph de Mest, who who was also you know this reactionary Catholic who believed that right. the uh, that society should be targeted towards towards God, towards oh, the ultimate goal of society should be towards God, and then hierarchically everyone reports to you know a higher person in the church, and then the Pope is the highest who reports directly to God. So you have this sort of social hierarchy, which is, and perhaps, you know, I'm probably completely, completely different here, but it it does make me wonder how does Ve describe it in such a way that it doesn't turn into this form of political thinking? Yeah, I I mean, I think that's a really, really good question because she would have been absolutely opposed to that. I mean, she, she looks at the end when she's trying to describe what, a new France would be like once the Germans were gone. They had a chance to, to start all over again, which very few countries ever have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and she thinks that the, that the society needs to be oriented towards a highest good. I mean, she thinks the leaders actually need to take a profession of faith, make a profession of faith, uh, that there is a, an absolute good. Now, as one of my colleagues in, in France has pointed out, uh, 
for all of that, it is not the church that's going to direct it. <laughs> uh, she thinks that, well, I mean, she wants in, in, our, in our being rooted that there, she thinks within our, the traditions of France and within the West, uh, that, that there is a spiritual tradition uh, of, of how to live with each other and live oriented towards something higher. And she thinks it needs to take place in sort of very different milieus. Uh, we need to be rooted. It's not just an ideological belief or, uh, or a totalitarian institution that will direct this all. She thinks that there is a way of living in almost nature. Uh, I mean, it's within towns as well, though. Um, that we can naturally come together and balance each other if we think something, you know, if we have some sense of, of something higher. And she thinks the problem is that too many institutions, the church is one, but certainly the state as well, gets too heavy handed. Mm -hmm. And then it makes itself an item. Uh, she's, she's really actually rather optimistic uh, that a culture can, can be, she doesn't use the word pluralistic, but can embody several different views within something higher that balances all of them. And that if they can, people learn to balance themselves against others, uh, which means respecting what others think, uh, then she thinks we, we in fact are living our spiritual best uh, in, in this world. I mean, it, it, it's very, it's probably very utopian, uh, but on the other hand, I think it also is terrifically realistic. You know, what, what are we really talking about uh, in terms of living spiritually well? Mm -hmm. And I think that you need to, to develop that before you start jumping in and saying, oh, that'll never work. So we need it. We need an authority that will take care of it for us. <laughs> uh, she, she needs it to be a natural, like a garden natural, sort of ecology of spirituality. Wow. Yeah, I guess as soon as you start saying we need this institution, we need this and that, you're handing over your, your personal attention to something else. Yep. Just let, let, them take, <laughs> like, let them take care of my own attention, which is... It's never going to do it. So or it, we'll take care of it for you. Yeah, yeah, we'll tell you what attention is. I mean, that's even that's potentially even more destructive. So is this why, you know, the title of your book was interesting for me, Simone Vale for the 21st Century. I mean, of course, uh, I might get the dates wrong here. So she's born 1910 and uh, passes away in nine, late 1940s? 43. 43, okay. Um, uh, during the war. So, you know, it's only almost 100 years later which doesn't seem that long so do you do you think you know going from your title do you think there's been such a drastic change that there's something in Vale which you know now almost seems uh, completely alternative to our way of well of course she would say it's in her day it would be different for our way of living but now do you think there's something even more different in her way of thinking which we could retrieve for our present time yeah I mean I, th I think you know sometimes uh, when you talk about somebody offering a solution, it depends upon what you think the problem is. Uh, and obviously, in many ways, things have completely changed. Uh, I mean, if she thought that writing the need for roots was going to offer an alternative for how a new France could be, well, that ship sailed a long time ago. Uh, and you, you can't go and take the need for roots and say, okay, France, this is you, really how you should be doing it. Uh, and you can't say it to, to Americans. But I think, you know, deep down, the issues are that she was facing, but perhaps are facing even more so now. Um, what, what I really wanted to call that book uh, in, in the very beginning, uh, before my publisher <laughs> said this isn't going to work, was how to love and think in a flattened world. Um, I like that and I think, 
Yeah, I know, but, but I don't know that you that you sell it uh, so easily. And in fact, you know, at the time that we were talking about it, everybody was worried about flattening the COVID curve, so they, they figured it would. Get, it would get like I'm mistaken. <laughs> uh, but but I, mean, I think the idea was that the world she saw was becoming increasingly flat. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, both social and scientific thinking are becoming you know, increasingly reductionistic, uh, moving down to a single principle. Here, this is how, how you solve all these things. Um, you know, econ- economists are the ones who uh, pretty much make social policy, and they, they're the ones who think morality is simply a matter of utilitarianism, you know, preference and uh, so on. And so, in that sense, our world is is the same, perhaps even more so, attempting to reduce things to a single principle. And her idea that there's more than one value at play here, there are higher values, and how you approach them uh, is what I think, you know, the value of it is for the 21st century. I don't think it's a, I or she has a blueprint for the 21st century. I, I, I Hate playing the prophet, and I don't mm-hmm. think you should you should make her her do it. Mm-hmm. But we have certain problems, mm-hmm. uh, and they they've been consistent for hundred years or more. And I think she saw deeply into them when she she died over seventy five years ago, almost eighty years ago. Uh, and I think that those insights uh, are still easily used now, or valuably used now. Yeah, I mean that's it's interesting in such a short time. I mean, you, as uh, you know, the founder and I believe president of the Vale, the American Vale Society. Why? Why do you? What happened? Why has she been so overlooked? Um, and I, I think she gains slowly, um, and in some ways that's that's been good. I mean, good thinkers read her. Uh, they don't necessarily always decide to work on it. Uh, but I think good people read her, and I think, I think they're affected. Um, I think in many ways, one person that I would compare her to is to Kierkegaard. Mm-hmm. Now, there are, there, there are lots of scholars who love working on Kierkegaard, and, and there are a great bunch of people that are really dedicated. But the fact is, most people read Kierkegaard, sort of get shaken up by him. And, and I think that's fine. And then they, they don't spend a lot of time developing a Kierkegaardian way of how we should, should do things. I mean, I think both he and they, and I, I think Wittgenstein's in this, maybe that Kierkegaard would be a fifth person I'd throw in that room. Um, I think you know, they, they get us to look at things differently. Uh, and all of them realize that living it is, is absolutely crucial. This isn't just an intellectual problem. It's a problem of love and disordered loves, which is an Augustinian problem. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of the, the, the famous, I haven't actually read it, but it's the famous book title by uh, Slotterdijk, where you know you have to change your life, which is the uh, the academic's worst nightmare. Maybe that's why yeah, these. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that's why a lot of the the thinkers that I maybe I'll try find a connection between the thinkers that I talk about. The ones that are ignored are the ones that are telling us you can't just you can't just read me. You you need to you need to do something. Yeah, I mean, and that's a it's a big problem. I mean, academics are well very good at talking about needing to transform things. There is no group that is more conservative and concerned to keep things in terms of the status quo. Uh, because you, well, I mean, if you've had to fight to be one of the 10% of people who actually get a job and then get tenure, believe me, you're not into shaking things up. <laughs> you're not going to risk that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, is there anything about Ve or about your book specifically that you feel we've uh, we've missed? Obviously, we could talk for hours, but um, is there anything key you think you'd like to add in? 
I think we've touched on, on, on most of the things. Um, you know, sort of one thing I would go back to in terms of her life, I, I think again, we need to keep looking at, at that life uh, and realize that as we dig deeper into what she thought and what all it meant, I mean, one of the things I've realized over 40 years of the Bay Society, I, I've been in groups where we had, uh, had seminars for a couple of years, three, four years on, on very interesting and important thinkers, but for three or four years, you know, we did it. After 40 years, we're, we're still going. I mean, I, I think we're, we're discovering new things, but I think that again, that can't simply be intellectual. I, I think you have to realize there was, there was a live person behind this um, and it cost something to, to think these thoughts. And I think that she believes that it's, you know, it's important that somehow, somehow you live it. I mean, you're not necessarily always the way she did. Uh, I think she was unique sort of in her, in her intensity. Uh, but that you can't just, you can't dream about it. Uh, you, you really got to put the body on the line in, in some way or other. Okay, okay. Put the books down and practice something, go do something. Or, you know, even... No, ah, do them both. Do it both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I just told you my whole career was I couldn't make up apparently allowed to, to decide between one or the other. <laughs> uh, so you, you, know, you can always, sometimes you can do both and you should be doing both. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, whereabouts can we find the book and also whereabouts can we uh, find out about the, the Vale Society? Um, the, there is a website uh, for it's just simply the American Vay Society dot org. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure if it's got the in it or not, uh, but you know, you, you, a Google search American Vay Society will, will send it to you. Um, one other thing that I'll, I can advertise for you: uh, a friend of mine by the name of Ron Collins um, was a retired law professor, actually at the University of Washington is just launching this week, I believe, uh, a new website called Attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's dedicated to all things Valia. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's an e-journal, uh, which will be published bi-monthly. Uh, you need to subscribe, but, it, but it's a free subscription. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, probably by the time this gets posted, uh, do a Google search for it for attention uh, and, and go look at that. Okay. Okay. Are you, uh, are you working on any more Vail books or philosophy books or are you taking a break? Um, I, I'm no, I'm actually, again, I, now that I'm retired, I can actually, I actually have time to uh, some of my pastoral work the la last few years before I retired was, was really so time consuming that I, I didn't have much time to write. Um, so now I'm, I'm picking that up, uh, and certainly this book was the very first one on my project list, but, uh, I'm working on one and I'm coming close to concluding it on called having an inner life. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not a they book, uh, but it very much depends upon, uh, distinction that they drew. At one point, she says, you know, there is a difference in the language of the marketplace and that of the nuptial chamber. And which really reflects the idea that there are different kinds of values. And I want to say that uh, the inner life has something to do with intimate values. Uh, and that many values, God, justice, beauty are the ones that she talks about are matters of the inner life. So what does it mean to have an inner life and, and to think these things? Okay, okay, I look, I look forward to it. So is that specifically drawing on Vey or is this your own personal? It, it, I mean, it, it draws very much on Vey for, for the 
for the distinction in the beginning. And in fact, I use her in a number of places. But it, it's also a way of drawing in a whole lot of other people, uh, Augustine, Kierkegaard, uh, Wittgenstein, Marcus Aurelius, Plato, um, you know, and so on. People who thought about what it means to have an inner life and to know oneself. Uh, and to talk about conceptually, what does that even mean these days? Okay. Okay. Well, I look forward to it coming out. Um, that seems to be a good place to finish up. So Eric Sprint said, thanks very much. Thanks. This was a delight. <laughs>